group of speakers are really some really very distinguished uh, scientists who do animal studies of chronic pain. So uh, uh, the first one is Maria Fitzgerald, who's at the University College London, and she is probably the world's expert on developmental aspects of, uh, of the nociceptive system uh, and uh, how that leads to chronic pain. So thank you very much, Cathy, and thank you, Tor, and everyone for inviting me here. So um, as Cathy says, I'm, I'm a, a basic neuroscientist, a sensory neuroscientist, pain neuroscientist, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about our real interest, which is, in, if you like, the vulnerability of, of the developing uh, pain system and how it might lead to, to uh, some of uh, chronic pain problems. So um, we, we all know the importance of somatosensory st stimulation. And so I want to step back a bit from abuse, from stress, which are obviously, of course, extremely important, but just kind of simplify this down now to think about the actual sensory stimulation that we get on our body surface when we're born in, a norm, in any normal, if you like, healthy mammal. And... Um, it's, it, it's very well established now that the interaction, the sensory interaction between um, uh, pups or, or between the mother and the pup or the mother and the child is a, a really important sensory input. And the withdrawal of that sensory input um, can lead to long-term effects on the developing brain. And the advantage of, of focusing down, if you like, on the actual sensory input is that it allows us to be able to trace uh, within the nervous system, pathways that may mediate these events, as opposed to the rather more diffuse problem of neglect or stress that are obviously very important but are very difficult to give, if you like, a beginning and an end to. Um, so um, that being the case and the fact that it is very well established uh, in animal models that, that this somat normal somatosensory stimulation is absolutely essential. The, the next kind of question is whether the nociceptive system really works in the same way. So whereas um, a, a, any uh, developing brain textbook, neuroscience textbook, would, would dwell on this sort of model system, which is used a lot in rodents, of whiskers, which, which are the main sense source for, re for, uh, for rodents, and the fact that the development of this system is highly dependent on input from the whiskers. In, it's, it's a very well-established and well-worked-on system, whereby you can interfere with individual whiskers or alter the amount of sensory stimulation that comes into a whisker, and you will alter the uh, way in which that part of the brain develops. Does, is, is the same true of the nociceptive system? Um, intuitively, one feels it probably can't be quite, because you, 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 it hardly could be a logical thing that your pain system can only become refined and developed as a result of repeated painful stimulation. That is not um, evolutionarily a good design. Um, so, so one has to assume um, that there's a slightly different kind of activity or sensory dependent input in the, in the pain system. And, uh, but it's a, it's a topic that has um, interested me a great deal for, for many years, which is that is noxious stimulation actually required for the normal development of pain systems. So in other words, if you never have any, will you never feel any pain? Um, uh, similarly, is, uh, is an excessive injury, injury which in fact somebody mentioned might be um, perhaps under normal circumstances um, over evolution, we would have died if we'd had that kind of stimulus early on in development. The fact that now we're in a situation where infants and children can in fact have quite serious injuries and survive, in fact they could be for um, clinical medical reasons that having those injuries, um, it does that actually alter the development of their nociceptive system in a, in a way that's kind of analogous to here, but, but maybe slightly pathological. So there is a big literature in this area, and I want to emphasize that I'm talking about the literature which is about producing a physical injury on the body surface. So that is either um, 
a um, the, the ones that the, the models that are most commonly used in this field is either an incision of the skin, which is uh, a model of surgery, of, of having a, a sort of local surgery. Um, in, inflammation of different kinds. It might be inflammation of the skin, of the joints. The, these, these are uh, another model. Um, nerve injury, so that's frankly uh, cutting or, or ligating a nerve at early points of development. There's also visceral injuries. People have um, done a range, a lot of scientists have looked at um, producing uh, inflammation of the colon and um, um, other viscera early in life. Um, using a, a, a sort of immune type of stressor, a specific immune stressor, um, and also um, maternal deprivation here, which, which, which I'm not going to be discussing here. If you look at these, these different models, and there are lots of them, and they're summarized in these two reviews here, um, there's clearly a particular time, a particular area, in, a time in development, these are all animal studies, obviously, uh, where there seems to be a particular sensitivity. So in other words, the type of injury may affect what happens, the age at which it is performed will affect what happens. There are early indications that there are sex differences, in the effects, but also the actual nature of the long-term effect. So, for instance, early visceral injury does appear to have a later critical period, that is, it's not until after the first week of a rodent's life, to, say, an incision injury, where the period, the critical period appears to be earlier. And a visceral injury has a very widespread effect it appears to leave the animal um, sensitive to both um, cutaneous skin drive pain as well as visceral pain for uh, the rest of its life. But all of these have shown that, that in other words, you have an effect, you produce uh, an injury, a physical injury, the injury resolves quickly because young animals repair tissue quickly, and by all histological and physiological events, uh, 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 inquiry, that injury is resolved and it is over. The animal grows up, you test it again when it's grown up, and you find that that animal is more sensitive to pain. Now, I want to emphasize that doesn't necessarily mean this animal is going to become a, an animal that develops chronic pain. It just is more sensitive to pain. So this is a classic example that came from, from uh, our own lab, but it's just a good you know, an example, where if an early life skin incision, you, the animal grows up. Importantly, the baseline sensitivity of this animal, it's not um, all the time in pain. It's not all the time got pain. It's that if it receives a second injury as an adult. So if you look, think of this as a surgical model, early surgery, you recover completely from it, but as an adult, you go back, you have new surgery. Now you are, compared to controls, you not only are more sensitive around the wound of that surgery, but also the pain resulting from that surgery lasts for longer. So it's more intense and it's longer lasting. And that's a very uh, classic model. It's something that you can show very easily. And there's important things to know about it. Firstly, um, the effect declines with distance from the original wound. So the new wound, when you're an adult, might be nearby and the effect still be the same. But if it's way, somewhere quite else on the body, you won't see the effect. That suggests it's a very central neural effect um, and, and likely a spinal cord mediated effect. Um, it also, it's important about the critical period, but really crucially, it doesn't happen if you block the sensory input at the early point when you make the first injury. And this is really important because this is showing that this is not to do with any effects of taking the animal away from the mother or being or um, being stressed or cold, or all these kinds of things, that if you block the actual sensory input that is coming from the wounded area at the time that you make the injury, you do not have the effect. And I think this is really important, that the input, specific nociceptic input, at a particular time of life can actually alter. For, for long term, these animals have been looked at now and they're way, you know, full-grown adults, old rats, they remain sensitive to a future injury. So 
We've summarized in this, in this uh, review all the different mechanisms, and I'm not going to dwell on them all in this lecture because I want to tell you about some new stuff, but, but it, it's really important. It was mentioned at the Levine work from the periphery, but I want to emphasize there's a huge literature about central effects here. Um, that in fact probably most of the neuroimmune effects um, that d definitely are a part of this, there's a, a definitely activation of, of local glial cells and neuroimmune pathways, is um, the, the greater effect is definitely central rather than peripheral. There's also, um, a, a, as, as we mentioned earlier, changes in the descending control pathways, stress pathways and so on. And there are not only local effects that have been reported of increased sensitivity, but many groups have also said that the baseline of these animal changes. So some, in some models, they actually seem to become less sensitive to all stimulation. Vision, hearing, touch, they've just become kind of strangely hyposensitive animals. However, if you revisit them with a new injury, a physical injury, they are more sensitive. So you can almost argue that the signal to noise for these animals has got greater. So these are important mechanisms. It's what neuroscientists spend their time doing, which is trying to work out what it is that's actually happening here. But what I want to focus on uh, today is about the clinical evidence and also the evidence for the involvement of the brain, specifically in brain pathways. So here's the, the clinical evidence that I'm aware of, specifically for the effects of pain or injury in early life, as opposed to uh, stress or neglect or abuse. So most of the clinical studies do arise from children that have been in intensive care when they were young. They have a lot of problems, and Grunau, who's been mentioned already, this group here, is the person who's made the biggest effort to separate out the possibility that it is actually pain by having a fantastic database and ruling out statistically many other components and showing that it is the number of painful, specifically tissue-breaking procedures that infants have which are the best correlated with the changes in brain structure that she sees. So this is a, 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 a series of studies that are very powerful. Uh, so Ellen Walker, my colleague, is following up with sensory testing in children that have been, again, been exposed to intensive care. And she finds that surgery, mild or intense surgery, is another big component that affects the sensory testing. She published some years ago the effect of a big follow-up group when they were 10 years old. She's just finished um, looking at them again when they're 19 years old, and she's just about to publish those, she's seen really amazingly, interestingly, and different responses. And it's all around their somatosensation and the pain that they feel. That as opposed to, and she's been able to rule out anxiety and other um, stress-related events. So, but it's, it, as somebody's pointed out, you can't randomize this. We can't, we can't really get to the bottom of this unless we look at animal data. And my interest is, when is it in the development of these nociceptive pathways, how does this vulnerability arise? How is it that if you like a normal individual Somebody who, if you like, has not been abused or stressed, but is, if you like, in the more regular population, how could their sensory uh, pathways and nociceptive pathways get influenced by some early event in their lives? Because after all, we all fall over all the time. We all hurt ourselves when we're young. You know, pain, you could argue, is part of normal life. When does it become abnormal? So... As I said, intensive care is abnormal. Surgery is a real possibility that infant surgery doesn't have to be very severe, could be a problem. Accidental injuries and also the possibility of um, uh, joint inflammations and so on that could determine the way in which your, your uh, pain pathways work. So just focusing for a minute on surgery, one of the interesting things about the animal model that I told you about just now, the one that had the uh, early surgical incision, is that we in the UK, and I'm sure it's true here, we have to do that under anesthesia. So those animals that were exposed to an early injury were anesthetized, just like 
um, your eye would be if we had to have surgery. And therefore, and yet they still had these long-term changes. All the controls were done with anesthetic only and so on. Surgery under anesthesia was not enough to prevent these changes. So we decided that we would look at the evoked potentials in the, in, in, in the brain to see what's actually going on under surgery in young animals. Now, what I just want to, I'm sure you're all familiar with what an evoked potential is, but I just wanted to uh, make it quite clear that the newborn, in, newborn infant human brain we have shown is capable of giving a strong, very clearly defined nociceptive evoked potential from the very earliest age that we can record, which is actually 25 weeks um, uh, premature. So there's no problem about there being nociceptive input into the brain. In fact, I think it's very powerful in, in, in young infants. And these are infants that had to have a noxious input. They had heel lances as a result of their uh, treatment that they were getting. So obviously this is um, part of clinical care. And the, here the EEG recording is actually triggered to the point at which the lance penetrates the skin. And you can see here that there's a very, very clear nociceptive response. And this is using near-infrared spectroscopy to show that you get very, very strong uh, changes in blood flow as a result. And, and, and the important thing, though, is we can see this is a really useful clinical measure, but in terms of understanding what's going on, we have to look and see whether the same is true in infant rats. And it turns out it is. So here is a seven-day-old, P7-day-old uh, rat, and this is a 30-day-old rat. Um, they're very different. I just want to show, explain now that these are not classic EEGs like are recorded in man. These are... Um, electrocorticograms. So in other words, what we're doing here is recording from the surface of the somatosensory cortex directly. And in this case, these animals are anesthetized. And I would also like to just briefly point out that this way of, um, uh, I'm going to show these a few times, this way of expressing this data, rather than the classic evoke potential, which I'm sure you're all used to, which is a voltage time plot, this is actually, these are plots of exactly the same thing. It's just that the data is decomposed. And by that, I mean that it's uh, broken up into the different frequency components of this same change. And you can see here that there's actually a huge difference between a C-fiber, a nociceptive input in a young animal, which gives a, a, a very, very coherent, strong, but short-lasting response compared to an older animal where it, there's a much more complex patterns involved. So to the experiment, what we were doing is we were simply anesthetizing these animals and we were taking the animal up through steps of isoflurane. So this is kind of, I'm not an anesthetist myself, but this is, these are the kind of things that if you're an anesthetist you would do, you would start fairly low level, you would then take them up. And an anaesthetist will decide to stop anaesthetizing when there is no reflex response, when you do not get any movement anymore from your infant. Now, you could see straight away here that these are the youngest animals, these are the oldest animals. So downwards is increasing... Um, uh, sorry, I said so, so that completely the wrong way around. I'm so sorry. These are the youngest. It's this direction. It's increasing age. This direction is increasing depth of anesthesia. And you don't read, need to really interpret these pictures to see right away that the youngest animal is the most resistant to anesthesia. Therefore, you anesthetize a young animal, you give the same noxious stimulus, you've got a very strong brain response. And there will be no reflex movement, no behavior but still that input is going into the brain. That's really important because there are a lot of long-term consequences of early life surgery in terms of brain development, of ability, school ability, this kind of thing. So we think it's a real possibility that actually when we anesthetize a young animal or a young human, that in fact a lot of nociceptive input is going into the brain. Now, what happens if we then perform some surgery? And again, this is very, very stylized surgery. This is a classic skin incision response. And this is what happens. 
So here's our picture again with the, the P7 animal, the weak old animal, and the increasing steps of anesthesia. This is what happens if we give a skin incision. It gets even worse. It exacerbates the problem. That now you combine surgery under anesthesia. You're never going to do surgery any other way. It's going to be under anesthesia. And you have got this at the very highest level of, um, of isoflurane, which is a really high percentage. You've still got a powerful input. However, when you look at an older animal, the anesthesia works. Interestingly, at very low levels, the skin incision does increase the input to the brain. So there is a real uh, low levels. But once the anesthesia is raised enough, you, you're, you block the effect. So the, what I want from this, um, from this result to, to take home is that anesthesia does not block pain. It, it, it blocks a lot of other things, but it doesn't block the input. And therefore, the most neonatal anaesthetists who care about this, know that you must put local anaesthetic around the, the wound as well. You must block the input. Anaesthesia enough is, it, on its own is insufficient. And therefore, this is just giving you an example of how, in, if you like, a population that have not been abused, that have not been stressed, but they've had a medical requirement for um, surgery, that this could actually be quite a serious thing that so much input still goes into their brain. So the, the second and last thing I want to tell you about is how do we know, how do we know that it's important? How do we know that being um, that the developing brain it actually matters whether there's this great big input to it or not? And at what age does it matter? And will it change things? And we believe that the only way really that we're going to be able to examine this is for not under anaesthesia now. Now we just want to know. What, how is the developing nociceptive system working? And we've developed um, a, a system here of recording. Again, we're recording from the surface of the somatosensory cortex, but now this is in awake, active rat pups. And this has taken us a long time to develop, and I'm very pleased to say that it's now going to be published because this is really a very difficult thing to do. So we've got very young pups that are living with their mum in a litter and growing up as far as possible completely normally. But they actually have an implanted uh, electrode um, sitting on the surface of their somatosensory cortex and they've got a subcutaneous transmitter which is tiny, is sitting. And these, these animals, I don't expect you can see it that well, but these animals have actually got this and they, this is their, their, their normal growth. They're putting on weight, they're interacting normally. As far as we can tell, these animals are growing up normally. But what we're doing is that we're recording continuously the activity in their brain. And all that this slide shows is how the background activity changes with age, which fits very well with human studies. And what this is showing is that we get the same data cross-sectionally as longitudinally. So for pups that are growing up, we are able to plot uh, their, the, the activity in their, in, in their somatosensory cortex over time as they're growing up, same pup. We can also plot the activity cross-sectionally with different pups. And actually, the, we, we're looking at the same thing, which is very reassuring. But the point I want to make for this talk, I don't want to uh, overstay my welcome, um, is that in an awake animal, you see a very different pattern from an anaesthetized animal, which is not really surprising, considering how, what the anesthesia works on the brain. But what we were very surprised to see is... So these are these same plots that are showing the frequency distribution and the, the energy, the power, if you like, of activity in the uh, somatosensory cortex. And you could see that in a young animal, look how much activity there is to a noxious stimulus in an awake, normal, uh, weak old animal. Really, really powerful. Which actually, and actually, it decreases with age. This is not so surprising for those of us who know a lot about the developing brain. There's a, you know, there's a lot of inhibition and a lot of pruning, a lot of organisation, but these animals show a hugely powerful response. But then we didn't want to ask the question anymore: What happens if we keep on sort of squeezing them and poking them and so on? We wanted to know at what stage in an animal's life does a state of pain, 
an understanding of a state of pain. So, in other words, it's not that somebody's coming up and sort of jabbing you, but rather you're walking about in pain, which is not at all the same and doesn't necessarily require a specific stimulus. And to do that, we went back to our plantar skin incision. So basically the animals, again, they had to be anaesthetized, that is the, uh, the law. So they were anaesthetized, they, they've got these recordings, these long-term recordings in them, and the incision was performed. They then recovered from their anesthesia for a, bit, a considerable period of time, and we sampled the activity in their somatosensory cortex while they're wandering around. They were always awake, they were always active, they were interacting with their mums, but they had a wound on the sole of their foot, which all other studies have shown that is sensitive. And it, it, as far as one can tell, it hurts, just like it would us. So what, what do we see? Well, um, Again, I'm, I'm sorry about, about uh, presenting data in a way that is complex, but what I want you to look at is this is sampling five minutes after the wound, 30 minutes after the wound, 60 minutes after the wound. And the red line is where the uh, where, where animals sort of had their skin, this incision, and the blue line is those that haven't. And in a very young animal, and these, these are the frequency plots, now plotted in a slightly different way, but these are the frequency plots of the activity in the brain. The point here is that at one week old, although they responded to the incision and to, a, um, to being squeezed or poked, their brain activity hasn't changed. They're wandering around with a wound. It hasn't changed. But if we look at P14, so these dark lines are simply showing you what is significantly different. That's all. So you could see already that there's an early, short-lasting decrease in theta activity and gamma activity, a decrease that's likely a desynchronization that activity is not, not at all the same as in an adult. And so at 14, that's two weeks old, quite grown up, is when we see a, um, a decrease in the, in the theta and gamma activity, but nothing after half an hour or an hour. It's only short-lasting. Now we have to wait for the animals to grow up to see anything that lasts particularly long. So at P21, they're now three weeks old, we are again seeing a short-term decrease in theta energy and what, uh, seeing that again still at P30. But what's different is an increase in gamma activity, which is highly associated with pain in adults. And that's really striking at five minutes, but only when an animal is 30 days old do we see a long-lasting change in brain activity. Now, we're only looking at the somatosensory cortex, remember. We're not looking at all the rest of the brain where probably all sorts of important things are happening. But this is the first time that anybody has any, ever monitored the way in which the brain changes in how it processes uh, an animal having pain, if you like, over time. And I want to finish uh, with what our sort of, if you like, simple working model. This was published by uh, Karen Davis last year, and I think some people didn't agree with it, but it appealed to me quite a lot as, uh, from the developmental perspective. She was kind of saying that all of us who are looking in the brain for pain areas and so on, we first need to find somewhere that simply has an on-off switch and is to do with ouch. Either something hurts, or it doesn't. And actually, for most of us, we might spend a long time thinking about it, but actually, we know. You know whether something hurts or not. That's it. And you don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. So she, would, she was arguing that there's a part of the brain that we should all be looking for, which somehow or another really does indicate that. And then, of course, pain experience is much more complex than that. And therefore, one might expect um, this area to feed in then to more complex circuitries, which are, may, are probably much more important for chronic pain. And what I would like to suggest is in very young animals, we've really only got this bit. And then as animals grow up, and three weeks is quite grown up for a rat, I have to say, it's kind of like adolescent, so, but, um, is really when we begin to see some more complex circuitry. And what I would like to propose is that 
Here lies the vulnerability. It's the development of this complexity as opposed to this relative simplicity. And it's the movement from one to the other that leaves a window of opportunity, which for my interest is to do with um, painful stimulation, but for many of you it's more interesting perhaps to do with neglect or abuse, this kind of thing. But that we need to understand this window of vulnerability and the processes involved in order to be able to kind of get in there and find out what's happening in the brain. Okay, thank you very much for listening. And I'd like to particularly uh, thank my colleagues Pish and Chan, Lorenzo Fabrizi, who really did do all this work. Thanks very much. Thank you.